And without much further ado, really, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Franz Leano from the University of Cambridge. Uh, I would just say uh, the reason for inviting him is that he will be presenting his paper, Pico, Normal Passwords. And when I saw that paper, I just read the abstract and I got, um, I really got provoked. <laughs> and I thought, this is, this is a real professor writing. It's like, yeah, passwords are bad and we should get rid of them, sure, but, um, well, how can we do it in, in real life? So I'm really looking forward to this presentation, and Frank, stage is yours. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So it's a pleasure to be here. As Claire said, please ask as many questions as you want. The paper that he read. Uh, is available on the web, but it's not even the final version. I'm still uh, writing it. I gave this talk uh, first time in March, and the final version, post proceedings version, is due later this month, so I'm still uh, working on it. And uh, look for the final version on my webpage, but more than that, interact with me today so that some of the stuff that comes out of this can also be. So the title. Pico no more passwords is motivated by something that I'm sure you have experienced as well. As a computer person, I have to be the unofficial help desk of friends and family, as I'm sure all of you do as well. And so one of the things uh, was, okay, so you work in computers. Why do we have to uh, do all this mess with passwords? Why is it so complicated? Can't you make this stuff simpler? You've been working in computer security. Uh, and so it used to be that uh, passwords made sense when you had one difficult password to remember, but you know, difficult wasn't that difficult, I and mean, maybe eight characters were considered fine, and uh, you didn't have that many passwords. And what happens now, uh, people have plenty of things that they have to secure with passwords, and the passwords themselves have become more complicated than uh, a regular human memory can manage. We're, we're talking memory of normal people, not, not the people who obsess about uh, memorizing 100 digits of pi and having contests about it, which I'm sure there's many of us in here. <laughs> we shouldn't use that as the standard. So the security people tell the regular humans that uh, passwords must be unguessable and impossible to brute force. It means they cannot just be like a cat or fish or the name of your cat or fish. They have to be long and complex and full of special characters. And uh, they cannot be something that uh, people can guess by looking at your Facebook page and knowing what your pets are and all that stuff. Uh, if you have many accounts, and everybody has many accounts, uh, all the passwords that you use must be different. Uh, the passwords must be memorable, and you must actually memorize them. You're not allowed to write them down. Uh, and when you are entering them on the computer, you must type them correctly, even if they look like this, and you make a mistake about here, and you all, all you see is asterisks, and you're not sure where you can, you can't even correct, you have to delete the whole thing and then start again, and hope that you don't make another mistake about here. Uh, and to add insult to injury, you must change the passwords every few months because otherwise if there's a compromise, you might expose things for years and years, so you have to keep changing your passwords. So um, there's reasons for scratching one's head. If you uh, dispassionately look at all the requirements that we, uh, we security people tend to give to ordinary humans, then, you know, how can you satisfy all these things together? If each one of these is a subset of the possible passwords. The intersection is the empty set. There's no way that a password can be at the same time as complex as it should be, and memorizable, and you have 37 different ones of them, and you change them every few months, and so on and so on. Uh, so there is several burdens that we are imposing on users. One of inventing passwords that actually match all these requirements. Uh, then once you've invented a good password, uh, you have the bug burden of remembering it or them. Uh, and then even if you can remember that password, that's the non-trivial burden also of entering it in the computer. So all these three things that we are imposing on users are actually beyond feasibility. There is a wonderful paper on uh, the usability of security systems by the group from Angela Sasse in London, uh, which talks about the compliance budget. 
Has anybody heard of the compliance budget? No, okay, so if that's news to you, you should read this paper. Uh, it says, basically, there's a, you know, people are willing to follow the rules of the system administrators, but uh, every time the system administrators ask for something, it's a bit of a nuisance. Okay, so there's a kind of, uh, up to a point, I will follow these rules, and after that, it's just going to be too much, right? So uh, the more burden that is imposed, and the quicker this budget is reached, and once you uh, you are at the end of this budget, then the user is going to stop complying with, with the rules, just trying to uh, try to bypass them in every possible way. So uh, we are spending quite a lot of the budget, of the budget, compliance budget of the users uh, with all this. The trouble is that for people who, um, let's say, impose or deploy the password, so for example, someone who's a web developer and makes a new application <coughs> says, okay, now I have to distinguish between my users, so I have to do something uh, to secure the accounts, and what I'm going to do, I'll set the password. That's the obvious thing to do, because in every other uh, web account, the user has a password. They already know how it works. Uh, I don't have to explain anything. It's an obvious thing. It doesn't cost anything to issue a new password. And uh, for me, it's the cheapest and easiest thing to deploy. And it can't be that bad because everybody else is also doing it, right? So this is what economists call a tragedy of the commons. Has anybody heard this term before? Tragedy of the commons? Yeah, okay. So for those who haven't, the tragedy of the commons. The commons is like a common uh, uh, piece of grass where you can bring your cow and sheep to graze, okay, and it, it just belongs to the village as a whole. It doesn't belong to anyone in particular, so you can just bring your cows and they're going to be fine. Uh, but there's only a finite number of cows that can comfortably graze in these commons. And if you bring twice as many cows, then none of the cows are going to have enough to eat and, and be comfortable and so on. So uh, you shouldn't overgraze, otherwise it's bad for everybody. If you're just one farmer and the commons are there, and you say, well, this has reached capacity, but I have two more cows. Why don't I just bring my two extra cows? Nobody's going to notice. It's going to be the same. And the benefit for me is I feed all my cows. And it's not a big deal for everybody else. Uh, and if everybody does that, then there's you know, two, three more times cows than the commons sustain, and then it becomes a mess. And this is exactly what happens. You know, every web developer says, what? what's my password going to do? That's bad, and because everybody else is doing it. Uh, and so this. Uh, just doesn't work. And so even though web developers consider the passwords to be the cheapest option for user authentication, users hate passwords. And they have a uh, good reason for hating passwords. So passwords are dead, has been said many times. Passwords are not dead. Actually, passwords just should be dead. And uh, what we saw in the previous slide was just they should be dead on usability grounds. They should also be dead on security grounds, of course. Uh, because, uh, first of all, the fact that the requirements that we had in the previous slides are impossible to satisfy simultaneously means that some of them will not be satisfied. Even if you have a user who's willing to comply, they cannot comply with all of them simultaneously, so they're going to drop one or two. You can't predict which ones. Depending which ones you drop, you have insecurity. So uh, if they drop the requirement of making the password very long and complex and full of crap, then you're going to have a weak password. A weak password can be guessed or can be brute force. Uh, you can have uh, users dropping the requirement of having a different one for every account. This is very common occurrence. Uh, and if passwords are reused, then it's sufficient that a password is broken at one site, and then uh, the other sites can also be attacked, or a password is leaked at one site without even being cracked, or uh, there is a malicious insider at one site. All these things will cause all the other sites where this password is reused to be compromised. Uh, and then because the password um, system is too complicated to actually work, then users will sometimes forget the passwords and uh, the system providers have to cater for that with ways of recovering and they have these questions like, you know, which high school you went to and what's your mother's maiden name and all that. And uh, sometimes it's much easier to get in that way than by cracking the password. So uh, just the fact that the burden of remembering passwords cannot be met, uh, you can get in through the uh, recovery uh, mechanism that Sarah Palin comes to me. And 
then of course there's a fact if you can remember the password it can be uh, then written down somewhere uh, it's unlikely that it's going to be written down in a way that is impossible to get that from someone else who's there so that's another avenue for getting through besides attacks that are enabled by the fact that the previous requirements are impossible to meet altogether there's other things that passwords are susceptible to and uh, one of them is uh, phishing where another site puts up a um, front that looks like the site where the user is trained to type the password and then the user types the password in the other site uh, and then the bad guy gets it and this is just one automated form of social engineering and there are of course several others that uh, tricks that the bad guys can use to uh, persuade the unsuspecting users to part with their password and then there is uh, key logging which is uh, similar but in a different category where there is a piece of uh, malicious software on your computer that watches every keystroke and if you are typing a password even if it's a very complicated <coughs> password even if it's a very long password that nobody could crack the keylogger just records every keystroke and you're done so there is a, a um, famous quote from Bill Gates uh, from 2004 there is no doubt that over time people are going to rely less and less on passwords people use the same password on different systems they write them down <coughs> and they just don't need the challenge for they in this case is passwords don't need the challenge for anything you really want to secure so uh, passwords should be dead even though they are not dead quite yet unfortunately so the question here is what if we could start again from scratch and I realize we can't start again from scratch this is what I was that in. you can't do that it's impossible it's never gonna work that's true okay it's never gonna work but what if we could restart from scratch what would we do what is the best possible thing that we could do instead of password passwords are no good we may be stuck with them for compatibility shackles what if we didn't have those shackles could we come up with anything bad so uh, this is the space where I'm at with this talk and there have been many interesting proposals for fixing passwords or getting rid of passwords uh, or doing something better than passwords especially on the web now on the web it makes sense to this on the web uh, first of all because the web is responsible for the proliferation of passwords that we've had over the past decade uh, before the web there weren't that many things that ordinary users like your green grocer had to authenticate to um, and second because with the web you have a uniform interface everything looks the same everything looks like something that can be rendered by your browser so it's fairly easy to develop a solution that we work for uh, across many sites however for the user for the non-technical non-computer user uh, it's really not enough to say well I'll fix the passwords for the web and every other password still have to type the password and still follow all this bullshit requirements that we said earlier uh, for a user a password is a password if a password is a nuisance it's, it's a nuisance whether it's a web password or a login password or uh, a file encryption password or whatever other type of password so uh, we have to uh, aim at the right level and uh, if you're going to do a proper job get rid of all passwords not just the web passwords so if I start from this uh, standpoint what are the minimum requirements that any solution should have well first of all if uh, I am fed up with the fact that uh, it's impossible to memorize passwords, I get the, the first thing uh, has to be that users should not have to memorize passwords or any other thing that resembles passwords some people have made things that are not passwords made of letters but passwords made of squigglies or passwords made of you know remembering faces of other pictures or stuff like that too. So first point users should not have to memorize secrets that's for catering to the usability that's not the only usability point I showed many others but that's the minimum minimum uh, for security the whatever replacement we come up with should be at least as secure as passwords and here I mean as secure as the passwords would be if we could make them work uh, given that from what I said it's obvious that passwords are insecure because the requirements that we uh, we ask for cannot be met if they could be met we want something that would be as secure as that 
And then, because we've seen that one of the failure of passwords came about because uh, we went from just having one or two to having uh, dozens of them, this new method should be scaled even to the thousands of applications. Uh, it, it is a fact that we are going to interact with more and more uh, computer systems that will uh, not necessarily look like computers, they will not look like this, uh, they may look like everyday objects, ubiquitous computing, all that kind of stuff. Imagine authenticated to each one of them with a password to so, so, uh, non start. So, uh, for scalability, the new method should work with thousands of apps. Now, I use the term apps here and in the paper uh, as a redefined word to mean anything that asks you to authenticate to it. So, the app is the verifier, uh, it's not app in the sense of the stuff you install on your smartphone. The, the app is the thing that would ask you for a password. Because the system I'm going to propose relies on a token, and so the password, what you know, becomes the token, what you have, <coughs> then for any solution that uses a token, you also have these other uh, essential requirements. First of all, that if you lose the token, you can still get at all your accounts. It's not like your life ends there and you have to restart from uh, when you were two years old. Uh, and second one, if you lose the token or someone steals the token, then they can't get uh, at you. It's not like the token is instant recipe for identity theft. Uh, it should be that just possession of the token is not enough to impersonate you. So, uh, the zero point something where minimum requirements any solution should have, the one point something are things that I claim that my solution offers, claims what Pico does and uh, you are most welcome to challenge me and say you promised that you would provide that but actually I don't think your solution is offering that. Uh, so first of all the user no longer has to remember password that's the same as 0, 0.0 before. Uh, another essential thing it works for all credentials not just the web passwords and uh, one problem is that users choose weak passwords with the Pico system, uh, which is a hand <coughs> token, uh, with the Pico system, the Pico chooses the password. It doesn't even use passwords, actually. It chooses a credential for you, so uh, it's impossible to make a weak one. Uh, another problem of passwords is that users reuse them. You reuse the same one on different sites, and uh, with Pico this cannot happen either. Uh, phishing is also impossible because of a recognition between the, uh, the app, the verifier, and the Pico. This is something that, in some cases, you do with passwords when you have some kind of SSL machinery, for example. So you have to make sure that uh, anything that is not recognized is refused. Another problem, which is uh, related to phishing, but it's also uh, related to usability, is that uh, with uh, one thing we fix with Pico is that the user does not have to select the correct credentials. Imagine that you had a uh, token that knew all your passwords and uh, like a kind of password wallet, these things exist for PDFs and things like that. Um, this says, I mean the screen I have here, which is not reproduced here, it says Welcome to MNAUD12 blah 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 at the client no. username and password. If I had this list with all my maybe 100 passwords, I could pick the one that matches that and I would know which username and password it is and then I would have to type them in. And I could be tricked into selecting the wrong, uh, the wrong credentials. Being tricked is related to phishing, but also having to select this is a burden. If I have that many, I mean, I can have a hierarchically arranged list and so on. But it's, it's so much better if the Pico decides uh, on its own which one is the appropriate credential for, uh, for the app that I'm interacting with. Network if dropping of the password is impossible in this system. Uh, this is something that some password systems uh, do. It depends on how the password is transmitted to the verifier, uh, but uh, sadly still not all of them. Uh, key logging, which is a kind of uh, local on the machine eavesdropping is also impossible. And related to that, but uh, separate and actually uh, more relevant to usability is that the user no longer has to type that password, which is a nuisance. 
in and of itself. So obviously, if you don't have to type the password, then you can't be keylogged. But you can still have things that avoid keylogging. For example, you attach a USB cable, and it, it pretends to be a keyboard and types the password, and that could still be keylogged. So that's uh, in that sense, 1.8 is distinct from 1.7. Uh, a totally independent uh, and uh, interesting aspect of using Pico is that authentication happens continuously, not at the session start only. So when you type in a password, for example, to unlock your screen save, then uh, the resources of your computer are available to you because you have just proved you're better by typing the password. Then uh, if you go out and get uh, another one of these uh, uh, swirly things. Uh, maybe you'll see, you'll see, okay, well, I might also just go to the toilet. And you're out for maybe 10 minutes, and your computer is there, and you haven't re-enabled the screensaver. It still thinks that it's you, because you just typed in the password for the screensaver earlier. So unless you have a very uh, very short timeout for your screensaver, you're going to have a window uh, in which the guy who was sitting next to you can still see what you had, check your emails, whatever, before you come back. If you have a very narrow window, then you're going to be uh, bothered very frequently by the screensaver going on and you having to repack the password. So uh, with the Pico, authentication happens continuously. And so you can say at sub-minute intervals, the app verifies that you are still there. And as soon as you're not there, it can lock the assets. And as soon as you're back there, it can unlock them. And this is something that um, is a great addition, uh, both uh, feature both for usability and for security. And finally, the user can authenticate from any client. This is not a solution that is specific to just uh, one particular machine. Now, to this list, uh, some people might expect uh, I would have to add, OK, it's going to be as cheap to deploy as passwords, and it can be deployed without changing the verifiers. These are things that I decide are not goals for the Pico, because uh, I want to be free from uh, these compatibility constraints in order to design a proper solution. Now, uh, this is not to demean them. Of course, without these, it's going to be difficult to displace passwords. So uh, later on, we may think of ways to uh, compromise on some of the design principles so that uh, we would provide something in that direction with the proviso that, of course, that's not where I want to go, but we have to start somewhere in order to break the vicious circle of, oh, it's not going to work because passwords are still entrenched uh, in a way that is undisplaceable. So this is the plan for the talk. First, what Pico promises. That was the previous slide. Second, how Pico works. And because Pico is a token, and if you lose the token, it shouldn't be something that other people can use in your stead. How Pico ensures it won't work if you don't have it. Uh, and uh, conversely, how Pico ensures that you can recover yourself if you no longer have it. Some special features uh, of Pico. Then a comparison with uh, work by others, both work that exists and work that uh, doesn't exist. I mean, real world things and uh, academic kind of stuff that has been described uh, in saying that Pico, if Pico doesn't exist yet. I hope that uh, some students will want to build parts of it with me, uh, but it, it's not there. And so comparison with both of these types. And as I just said, uh, examination of some possible compromises to reach critical mass. And finally, a roadmap to uh, the world domination or rather world liberation from us. <laughs> So let's start with how Pico works. How Pico works. Uh, imagine that a Pico is something the shape and size of a smartphone, although it doesn't have to be that. And it would have at least the following uh, components. It would have a camera here, display, and two main buttons. Okay, one button is for pairing. It's like setting up a password, and one, the main button is for like typing the password. We are not using passwords, but just think of these things. So 
So the picker is small, it's something you carry all the time, like your phone, like your keys, like your credit card. Uh, and it has a radio communication facility, it has a camera, and it has these two buttons and a display. Having said that, it doesn't have to be the shape I showed before. It could be a number of other shapes, so long as it has these minimum features. It could be like a key fob, it could be like a watch, it could be like one of these tiny MP3 players, uh, it could be a piece of jewelry. If you're willing to wear something like this on your ear, it could be a mirroring. <laughs> uh, the buttons could be soft buttons that you press on the screen, whatever. So we are not interested in the industrial design quite yet. So how Pico works? The place where the app, the verifier, asks for a user ID and password and is, is complemented by a visual code. And this visual code is what gets acquired by the Pico through its camera. Also, the Pico has a short range radio facility to communicate. So we have two channels. In the past, I have done quite a bit of work with some of my former students on multi-channel security protocols. Security protocols where you use several channels simultaneously to send different messages of the protocol because different channels have different properties. So the property of this visual channel, first of all, it's a unidirectional channel. It only goes in the direction from the app to the Pico. The, there is no visual channel from the Pico to the app. Uh, it has a very useful security feature, which is that the user knows for sure what the other endpoint is. This is not the case for radio. With radio, if I'm talking to something, the other end will tell me its identity, but I cannot be sure that it's not some other piece of radio that is saying, that is pretending to be this computer, and it's actually under the desk here somewhere. And so I'm thinking that I'm talking to PC2, and it says, yeah, I'm PC2, okay, right. But actually, it's something coming out of here. Whereas with the visual channel, if PC2 is displaying the code and I'm acquiring that code, then it cannot be the code that comes from another one. So that's an important feature of the visual channel. However, the visual channel has a limited capacity as well as being unidirectional. And so uh, we were saying earlier, uh, it cannot just carry a whole 4K public key. It can maybe carry the fingerprint, uh, whereas the, the whole public key could go over the radio channel, which doesn't have these capacity constraints. And the radio channel is also bidirectional. So I use both in the protocol for different purposes. So each app in the FICO uh, system has a uh, public key pair and a visual code. And the uh, visual code is basically a certificate on the public key. I have a picture here where, okay, this is a sub-signed public key certificate, whatever metadata is necessary, the name, the human readable name of the app, and then the public key of the app. This is signed by the security of the app, and then hashed, and this is what is in this, uh, in this visual code, which is acquired over the visual channel, whereas this other thing, including the full public key and blah, 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 is sent over the radio channel. So as I just said earlier, the visual channel is there so the user explicitly designates the chosen verifier, cannot be mistaken from uh, another fake one over radio. And then over radio they get all the data that is required and also they can talk back. So winding back by one, uh, the app self-certifies its own public key. The Pico acquires the visual code of the chosen app and talks to, uh, talks to the app by radio. Once it has uh, got the public key and verified that the public key matches the visual code, it can send everything, uh, all messages to the app, encrypted under that public key, meaning that no other uh, malicious impersonator can actually read that traffic, assuming that the uh, app has good control of its secret key. So this defeats the eavesdropper was one of my claims. And uh, the user cannot be tricked to type the password 
into the wrong app, I could type the passwords in quotes because I'm not typing any passwords anyway, but cannot be tricked into revealing credentials to the wrong app because the only app it's talking to, it's the one that has the secret key that matches the public key. And the public key is identified as the one uh, that was displayed by the genuine app. So this all looks very much like SSL. In fact, the mechanics are in essentially the same as SSL, but the fundamental difference is that SSL relies on a PKI, on a public key infrastructure, to certify uh, the, the public keys of the verifiers. And in this case, we don't have the public key infrastructure. Things are just self-signed. So the app shows its front page with a visual code like this. And whenever the front page is available, then two actions are available to the people. One of them is, so I'm here, the normal one would be enter your credentials and log in or access or whatever it means. But the other one that's also available from this, uh, from this state of the interface is to create a new account, if that's an account or whatever else. And uh, so this is done on the Pico with uh, the two distinct buttons. So the main button is the one that says, recognize me, let me log in, let me offer my credentials. And the parent button is the one that, that means, OK, I want to make a new account for myself, a new pairing between my, my people and this app. And so let's have introductions. Let me create an account. Let's do the initial pairing. So the main button, the one that I use when I already have a pairing with the app, uh, works like this. <coughs> the user of the people aligns the camera to acquire the code of the desired app. Uh, and this is the uh, hash of the public key certificate. The certificate and the public key themselves go over radium. Can be verified with what was acquired over the visual. And then because I have already paired with this app, uh, as Pico, I will have a number of slots. And in one of these slots, there will be the, uh, the one corresponding to this specific app, which I find by the public key. If the uh, app uh, was not among the ones that I knew, then I cannot do this, and I will stop. And stopping at this point uh, <coughs> is, uh, can be paired in the interface to the user with a phishing warning, because if you think you want to interact with this app and you press the main button saying log, log me in because I think I can log into this, but you can't, your Pico says you can't, then it means you are interacting with something that looks like something you thought you had an account with, but you don't. So maybe this is a fake. So this would be a good stage to uh, give you a potential phishing warning. Because uh, anything that pretends to be the real app that doesn't match uh, the one that you have in there uh, should not look like one that you think you already have. So anyway, assuming that instead this step goes well and it continues, then the Pico will send an ephemeral public key to the app. And the reason why it's an ephemeral public key as opposed to a long-term public key is so that you are protecting the privacy of the user. Because at this stage, the app has not yet proved to the Pico that it knows the secret key of the private key it is exhibiting. Are you still with me? Yeah. Is anybody lost? If you're lost, hands up. Okay. So, because the app hasn't told me that it knows the secret key of, my, of, of its public key, then I don't want to reveal which user I really am until I know I'm talking to the, with the right app. So that's why I'm just sending an ephemeral public key. And then I, Pico, challenge the app to prove the ownership of the app secret key with some challenge response that uses the app secret key. And once they do prove to me, oh, yes, OK, I have the secret key as well, then I can send them my long-term identity. So if this is an impersonator, they won't even learn that I was there, because they only get a temporary ephemeral public key. And then I send them my uh, long-term public key that's uh, going to be the, uh, <coughs> the other side of the mutual authentication. 
uh, the app challenge and the peak of proof of ownership of the people's account secret key, and that's that. And uh, from then on, uh, they have both uh, proved to each other that they are who they say they are, they have the secret key, they can set up a session key, and then uh, start the continuous authentication I was talking about, where through the radio, yes. I have a question. Does this mean you don't have any anonymity anymore? Because uh, if you give your own public key to them, different sites could um, compare the keys and match you as a single user. Yes, so uh, you are raising a good point. I am happy that you are, uh, you are asking the question if this was unclear, but I want to reassure you that this, is, this design is specifically to ensure that you are uh, as anonymous as you can possibly be with this because you have a different public key for every account. So in this slot, I store the public key of the app and next to it will be my own public and private key pair for that particular app. So for each account, I have my own pair. And in fact, even with the same app, with the same verifier, for the sake of example, Gmail, okay, I can have three Gmail accounts. Each one of them will have its own different credentials. And Gmail itself would not be able to link those together unless I do something at the application level. Okay, so um, precisely for preserving my um, my privacy, I am giving an ephemeral public key at this stage when I'm not sure that I'm talking to the right very far uh, instead of my long-term uh, public key. But when I said long-term public key, I meant the long-term public key for that particular account. So even then, they would have only been able to know that I was that guy that had been seen before for that app, but not linking to the ones from other apps. Okay. So what happens uh, with the pairing button? So I don't. Um, I want to create a new account with this app. Maybe I don't have one at all, or maybe I have one and I want to create another one. I start from the same state for the app, the same uh, initial screen, and I just press a different button on my Pico. Uh, acquiring the visual code is the same as before. If the app is known, then I may get a warning. Are you sure you want to make a new account? You already have one for this, but you're allowed to make one, so long as the app doesn't forbid this, and in fact, you shouldn't be able to tell, uh, then uh, repairing a second time is still allowed. Now, uh, I have to put in a little footnote here that if I do have multiple accounts, then one of my original claims is not going to be 100% uh, fulfilled, where I said that the user no longer has to select the credentials because they are picked depending on the app. Well, that is true in the sense that uh, the Pico will know that I'm interacting with this app rather than this app, but if I have several accounts with the same app, then of course there will have to be some kind of disambiguation as to say which one of your accounts with this particular app you want to use this time. So that can't be helped. Uh, I mean, there's, there's no theoretical way that you could select automatically if you have several ones to choose from. So as before, the Pico gets the full key of the app through the radio, checks against the visual code. Uh, then now it stores it in this slot, uh, at, or I, I should be more precise, it stores it temporarily until it has verified that uh, the app also gets, also has control of the corresponding secret key. It does the same trick as before for protecting the Pico's privacy. And then uh, the Pico makes its own key pair for that account. This may have been pre-computed if the Pico is a too slow a processor to do that on the fly, but that's uh, just an engineering detail. And uh, it sends the app, this long-term public key, for that account. As we were saying, it's specific to that particular account. And this basically allows the app to make a corresponding slot in itself where it stores the credentials for this user, which would be the public key uh, of the of that Pico for that account. And if we need to have a user ID uh, for the user uh, to identify itself with the app, then this can be defined through the normal user interface on the computer that would be used for defining the user ID, and then stored in that same slot. So uh, I am trying to make the Pico something that you have to um, do as little 
interaction with as possible. So I wouldn't like to have to type in a user ID on the beaker or something like that. You can still do uh, all the normal things with the keyboard on your normal computer and just use the beaker for this uh, crucial authentication part. Now, uh, this is fine for something where creating an account has no previous step, as in opening up a new email account with a free email provider. If you are opening, uh, creating an account which has to be linked with some real world resources, then there's another step for authenticating this binding. So if, for example, I am setting up an online banking, uh, an online banking account, and I already have a bank account with that bank, then I have some money somewhere, and when I create a new online identity here, then the bank, I expect the bank to link that to the money that I have deposited so that I can then use this to do online banking there. So there has to be some binding between this thing that I am doing here with the Pico, which is completely uh, coming out of nowhere, and this thing that I have done previously with the bank. So this binding is done with an, another channel, which is neither the radio or the visual. It's the bank sending me, for example, by post or by me going to the branch or whatever, sending me some other authenticator which could take the shape of a paper letter just to interact with the camera mechanism that the beaker has and then uh, what would happen is that the back end of the bank sent a letter to the user with a special uh, once only authenticator which says when you're going to pair up uh, and create your uh, new account with us then you have to exhibit an authenticator which is this visual code I'm giving you now. And so you would use the peaker to say, okay, here's the letter from the bank. Let's acquire this code and spit it out when you see this public key. So the, there would be one code which is the authenticator, the one, one only nonce that has to be shown to the bank to prove that you got that letter. Another one that says, this is the public key to which you have to send this, don't send it to anybody else. So you, you put that in your Pico and then you do this creation and you say, now here, here comes the authenticator that I got from you in the post. And then the bank is there. Oh, okay, now I can link that to uh, the actual backend money account resources to, uh, that are associated with this user. And uh, so at this stage, the app records in its backend uh, that the Pico's credentials are valid, and from then on, you uh, interact as in the previous slide uh, just by going with the main bank. So that's how Pico works. What am I doing for that? And let's see how the Pico ensures that it won't work if you don't have it. Now, there's nothing really special about the Pico. It's just a glorified password wallet that you hold in your hand, except it doesn't use passwords. Okay, it's, it's a bit smarter. It doesn't use passwords. It uses public key instead of passwords and so on. But it's basically a token that holds your credentials. Now, the, there have been other proposals of token that hold your credentials. What do you do when uh, you lose this token? You must make sure that others cannot use your token. So the traditional thing has been, OK, in that case, you have to enter a pin in the token. I said, but I'm violating my 0.0, .0 requirement here. You know, user have to type the pin that choose 1, 2, 3, 4, and all that kind of stuff. So let's see if we can do something without uh, relying, again, on a secret that you have to uh, type into your gadget. Also, I want to. Uh, offer this continuous authentication, which is not compatible with just typing in a pin, because I could still type the pin and then leave the thing on the desk or something. So uh, how can we secure uh, something you have as opposed to something you know? It's unacceptable if the mere physical possession of the people then control of all the credentials. And of course, this uh, implies we need some <coughs> tamper resistance of the Pico, because if the Pico is found and there is some kind of locking mechanism that someone can open it up, put depackage the chip, put it under the microscope, there is a colleague of mine who is a specialist in that at the University of Cambridge, uh, they can get all the secrets out of the Pico, then uh, it's not so good. So of course this is necessary, having some kind of protection. Uh, but from a design viewpoint, an even harder question is assuming that we can provide a sufficient level of tamper resistance 
of the hardware. How can I decide when to lock and when to unlock the Pico? What is going to trigger that? And so the answer uh, for Pico is to have uh, family feelings. The Pico has many Pico siblings, which are other little electronic gadgets. And when, it's, when, it's, uh, when the Pico uh, finds itself uh, near its family, it feels happy and it's unlocked. And when uh, the family is away, then it feels unsafe and it locks itself. So these siblings could be any kind of small uh, gadgets embedding some electronics. Imagine RFID tags, maybe slightly smarter than the uh, essential um, just price tag or RFIDs, but not that much. And they could be even smaller than the people itself, could be embedded in all kinds of everyday objects. And the crucial thing is to embed them in things that you are likely to have on you all the time. So it could be nose piercing, it could be an ear piercing, it could be your watch, it could be your cell phone, it could be your belt, uh, something fashionable, it could be your wallet. And uh, here, I mean, this is the image of the Pico, and this is uh, other things you wear, and um, the shapes can change. I mean, your, your watch could instead have the Pico, and the sibling could be the ring or something else. If you are in a different uh, age range, then instead of your piercing, it could be your wig or your dentures, or you, just, you choose whatever. Something that uh, you are uh, likely to have several of with you all the time. And these would be part of a K out of N secret sharing mechanism, where you have to have at least K shares in order to reconstruct the secret that will unlock the Pico. And uh, it's debatable whether the K should be equal to N, so N out of N secret sharing, that if any, even just one misses, then you can't unlock, or whether you should have several so that you can, for example, uh, one day have one type of earring, and another day have uh, another type, and so long as there's at least four of them together, then you can unlock the thing. I mean, uh, this is all uh, tunable design parameters. Yes? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay, great. Right. So let's try and finish this section now. So uh, two special uh, Pico siblings don't look like these ones. One is a biometric. So one of the K out of N uh, shares is going to be a bi biometric, like for example an iris scan, you have a camera anyway, you might as well use to iris scan or uh, fingerprint or whatever. All these things can be defeated in some way if the verification is unattended, but it just puts an extra uh, an extra hurdle to come across if someone has your Pico and maybe, I mean, you just, you're in the swimming pool or something where you take everything off and things are in your locker, they pick your locker, still they won't have the biometric. And then another different type of share, which is also important, is going to be a network server share. Now, uh, this means that in order to uh, do this authentication, the Pico needs to also talk to some server, your server, somewhere in the cloud. And this has a number of interesting properties. The, one of them is that you can audit when the Pico authenticates at your own server. And another one is that if you've lost everything, uh, they have raided your um, <coughs> swimming pool locker, they've gone with everything, you still have a way of saying no, you disable the network server even if they have got everything else, uh, your uh, Pico and Pico system. So, um, Well, we can, we can finish whenever you want. Um, I'll just go through this slide here, describing what I mostly said, talking on the previous one. Uh, the Pico's storage is, I mean, I put full disk encryption here in quotes because obviously the Pico wouldn't have a disk, but whatever storage it has is going to be encrypted. Uh, all of it is encrypted, including whatever mini operating system it has. And to unlock it, you need some secret, which is reconstructed out of this uh, chaos of any secret chain. So most of the shares are held by the uh, warm Pico siblings, and two special shares are this biometric and the network server. And these shares are pinged periodically by the Pico. So the timeouts are different for the radio ones and these other ones. So these ones may be verified, I don't know, once a day. The other one verified maybe sub-minute. And there is a, a decay timer so that I haven't heard this share for Ta, 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 ta. And when it goes to zero, then this share will be not available. I cannot use it to recompute the 
uh, care to bank secret. And uh, I can still reacquire the share if it doesn't go away within another longer time up, which is the case for the whole peaker. If the whole peaker has uh, been unable to authenticate for a while, then it just switches off and you have to require everything from zero. So that's the time when you're forced to do things like getting another biometric, getting another uh, network connection. And so uh, this, as I said, will allow you uh, auditing and remotely saving. So this is a, a kind of a side. Uh, a feature that Pico provides by doing this is coercion resistance. If you are uh, the super paranoid type, and I'm sure we have some in the audience, uh, then uh, one of the threat models uh, with passwords is that they kidnap and then they torture you until you tell them your passwords. Now, with the Pico, uh, they can't do that. I mean, you remove the rational uh, motive for doing that because there's nothing that you can tell them that will unlock a locked Pico if the Pico siblings are not there. So uh, I underline that you remove the rational incentive to torture. It doesn't mean that they won't torture. They can still do that just because they like it. <laughs> um, so if you are uh, James Bond and you have your Pico holding your credentials to log back into uh, into uh, M's headquarters, then when you feel you're about to be captured, you can just lose or destroy uh, one enough of your Pico siblings so that there aren't K available to reconstruct the thing. And um, if it's not even necessary to destroy the Pico, though of course you can do that. Maybe it's harder to destroy the Pico than just destroy Pico siblings. You can do uh, either or both. Uh, the security of this scheme is predicated on the existence of a safe place where you can do stuff and you're sure that in there you're not going to be kidnapped or tortured or whatever it is. And in, in that place, you have your network server, you have whatever backup we describe in the next few slides, uh, and that's it. But while you're away, you know, I'm, I'm going to uh, dodge this and before I do that, I might okay, decide I'm not going to use my Pico as I regularly do. I'm going to set some uh, security features, for example, saying I will disable unlocking while I'm away from the safe place. So while, while it stays unlocked, fine, I can still use it. And if at any point it becomes locked, the network server is not going to respond anymore. It's just going to stay locked, whatever happens. Now, of course, this is a nuisance for availability, because if it does become locked for a genuine reason, then I can't reopen it until I go back. Uh, but uh, if uh, security is more important for that mission, then that uh, ensures that nothing can be uh, done, even if they torture you to death. Uh, another thing that you can do is to have separate physical peakers that hold different sets of your credentials, and some of them that are really important, but you don't need on that trip, you don't need to carry them with you on that trip. So, uh, because this is time uh, to stop, let's have a break, and next I will tell you uh, how Pico ensures that you can recover if you're longer. 15 minutes break. Welcome back. What are we on next? We've seen how Pico works and how Pico ensures it won't work if you don't have it. How Pico ensures you can recover if you no longer have it. And, you know, like your mother always told you, do backups. Now, nobody actually does that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how can we make sure that backups are made, even if uh, nobody ever does backups? Well, uh, one solution I'm thinking of is to have a kind of docking station that's the thing that recharges your Pico. And everybody recharges a cell phone. Uh, and where you recharge your Pico, it also backs it up. So this, again, is predicated on the existence of a safe place, where you know, in this safe place, you're not going to get, to get screwed. You can have your backups in there. And so, on. so the place at home or at the headquarters of uh, uh, the Secret Service where you can recharge your Pico is the place where your backups are taken every time you recharge. And um, you have to have some kind of secure pairing between the Pico and your docking station so that only your authorized docking station can take backups of your Pico. You don't want someone finding your Pico and putting it into a docking station and taking backup. So uh, 
the secure pairing, I, I mean, yeah. authentication in um, in ad hoc systems without PKI and so on is what I have been working on for over 10 years. So uh, I am hoping that I could recycle a previous solution of mine to do this secure pairing, but I'm not discussing the pairing itself uh, at this level. I mean, we can talk about it if you like. But there has to be some secure pairing between the Pico and the docking station, yes? But if uh, the point of encrypting the data on the Pico is that you believe that the encryption is secure, Mm -hmm. Couldn't you just store it in the public on the web or wherever? I mean, does it matter? Yeah, as long sure. as you sing it so you can find it again, if you have the end part of the... I assume you have, you have to be able to... I mean, I mean, in theory, I can I can encrypt all my passwords and put them on, 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 on Google Docs or something, but I don't. I don't <laughs> have it. Yeah, so, so the actually... Uh, the first thing I thought of backing it up is, you know, if the Pico itself is tamper-proof, then um, the most common thought for backup is somebody who's going to back it up to their PC or something, which obviously is not going to be tamper-proof, um, which was actually my what I was thinking of asking a question about first. But um, you know, yeah, the backing it up to the web uh, it seems like an even poorer idea. Um, so, like, what are you envisioning for backup, or should we just let you? So, for for the backup, I envision something where. Uh, because the Pico itself is encrypted, I'm just thinking of just taking an image of the encrypted Pico. It has to be encrypted good enough so that if you lose the Pico, then you're not that worried that someone is going to uh, undo the stuff. So in that sense, yeah, in theory, you could store this on the web as well. Uh, I'm, I'm, it, I'm, it's just me, I don't feel so comfortable <laughs> doing that. But uh, as, uh, from a rational viewpoint, if, I'm, if I trust this encryption to protect me when the Pico has been lost, uh, that I even if someone can uh, open it up and retrieve the bits, then they won't be able to get at the credentials, then they should be good enough for also being on the web. The fact is that when someone loses the Pico, there's only that guy who has the Pico. When it's on the web, then you know, potentially everybody else on the web can, can do that. But it's just a kind of belts and braces. There's no real rational, strong argument for not putting it on the web. If you like, you can put it on the web too. Uh, the point of the tamper resistance is that even if the thing is encrypted in the Pico itself, there can be lots of other uh, side effects of, for example, there's going to be some buffer where these things get decrypted. Does this buffer remember something about the previous uh, versions of the bytes that it has seen and so on and so on? Lots of analog effects, uh, memory that retains stuff even after it's been switched off. And so for that, you still need some uh, careful thought about the uh, tamper-proofing of the hardware of the Pico, even if all its contents is encrypted. And so uh, one thing that we will discuss later, but I might as well, I mean, discuss it now since we are on that topic, is what do we do uh, for people who say, well, I'm never going to carry uh, yet another gadget. Why don't we make this into a real cell phone? I mean, after all, it looks like a cell phone in your pictures. Why don't I put this on my iPhone or whatever it is, or Android? Uh, and the problem is that is that the operating system of a general purpose uh, cell phone is just so big and complicated that you're never going to be sure if the thing you have is going to be swapped somewhere else or if the operating system gives you all the possible uh, I mean, access to the lowest level so that you're sure that plain text never hits the storage. Uh, you have these flash storage memories where things are written somewhere and then uh, the next time you overwrite it, it's actually written somewhere else for load leveling. And you want to make sure that none of this crap happens just because some other part of the OS thought it was a good idea to do that. So you want to have properly a design that is uh, planned for storing your credentials without concern for other things that is then retrofitted to that. So it may be that a way of getting people to adopt this is to make the people into an application for a smartphone. But it's not what I design it as because I don't think that this is anywhere as secure as something that's designed just to hold your credit. So, uh, coming back to uh, this slide, the Pico storage is fully encrypted, so I just dump it as is in the backup. And then to restore it, I can restore a backup onto, the, uh, onto a blank Pico that I buy from the store, but I then have to unlock the Pico. So that is the way that I am trying to minimize the number of extra 
uh, crypto constructions that I add on top of what I already had to have for locking and unlock unlocking the Pico. So once your Pico is unlocked, you can um, create and back up uh, new shares. This, this is basically the creation of new uh, Pico siblings. You can do that when your Pico is unlocked. When your Pico is locked, you cannot make other Pico siblings. And when, it, you, when you have a locked Pico, you have to have your Pico siblings to go back and, um, and open your, your backup that you just restored. I'll come back in a moment. I, I, I will just uh, finish this sentence and take your question. And uh, the other thing that you need to be able to back up is your Pico siblings themselves. So there needs to be some other uh, facility, which I haven't detailed, but which is something that uh, is a necessity in this system, so that if you do lose your Pico siblings, or if you want, if you another earring is more fashionable, you want to be able to register that, and all that kind of management. So, uh, if I'm being honest about what I see, the problems with this scheme is that all that ancillary stuff to do with the management of the Pico siblings, maybe the weakest point in usability terms, that users may think, well, it's much easier than having to type the damn passwords, but it's so much more complicated in terms of having to handle the Pico siblings. So yes, question. Yes, um, you, so you can put up, uh, you can restore an encrypted backup to the new Pico, uh, and you can basically do that as many times as you want to, so you can have several identical Picos. Is there any way to disable an old one, to say you lose it and you want to make sure that one doesn't work, since they're identical? That's a very good point. I guess that uh, uh, this is something that the network server share will help you with. You could have, so if you, um, I, I think that this is something that I need to think harder about. But uh, there could be something where a combination of maybe a serial number in the Pico and the stuff that is in, in the thing that you have backed up can be used to distinguish the various instances from each other, and you can set your policy at the network server to say, I will now only use this particular one, and the other one, I can tell it because I'm the master, yeah. I can tell it to disable itself. Yes, related, uh, very good question. Uh, you talk about the K out of N for unlocking. Yeah. Uh, do you see that as, as what you get out of that is a key, or is there some kind of sign? I mean, because the problem is, of course, for instance, RFID tags would be a very bad idea because someone would walk by you and they would have your yes. key. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so yeah. So it would have to be something where there is a protocol that runs between the Pico siblings and the Pico that is resistant to replay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so something where if you have overheard the conversation, you cannot use it to uh, predict the next few ones, so it cannot be the same and cannot be reconstructed from them. So it cannot just be the simple price tag, RFID is what I said, because if they just say the same thing over and over again, then obviously you have no uh, no recourse to someone who listens in and replaces. So, so would you say that the K out of M is more of a logic policy that the people decides, no, I have no I am in contact with K out of M siblings, more than a actual secret that can be constructed? No, well, what I, what I think of, I mean, I have a this is one of these things where until you actually build the implementation, you don't see all the full problems. But what I'm envisaging is that this uh, full storage encryption of the Pico is unlocked by a key that is built as this K out of N. Mm -hmm. So uh, as soon as the timeout says, I don't have enough to, to do this, then this key is deleted. And you cannot access, you cannot decrypt uh, anything that's in the Pico. And it stops working until. So uh, as in any real. <coughs> Uh, full storage encryption system. There is a part that isn't encrypted because otherwise you can't bootstrap. So that part would have to, you know, do the timeouts and stuff and say, but actually I cannot access any of the rest of the stuff because the secret decrypt is not there anymore. Mm -hmm. And I want it to be something where it's not a gate that is opened when you see um, K out of N shares, but it's something that without those shares, there's no way to decrypt because the key isn't there. So it shouldn't be something that is verified, oh, you have enough credentials, I'll let you read this. It's more like there aren't enough credentials to form the decryption key. Mm. Does it make any sense? So yes, it, it's, 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 I'm just trying, because the, the idea is that you have kind of accepted that someone will steal the encrypted 
data. Mm -hmm. That's part of the security of the system. You should still be safe. Yeah. And the challenge then, of course, is to get a copy of the key. Mm -hmm. And and I'm just trying to see because if it is basically a 128 bit or whatever key that actually encrypts the, the data on, on the device. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, if it's just K out of M, it seems like it would be, compared to all the security of the rest of the system, it looks like a key attack would be relatively easy. Uh, How would you do that? Well, as, as I said, because if, if, if you, that, that's, that's why I'm thinking, if you're just constructing the key out of the, the siblings, and it is just a static key, I mean, it's, I, I, I kind of have difficulty seeing how you logically will actually defend against being able well, to Well, it's not K out of N in the sense of no. chunks of the key, of course. No, it's no. K out of yeah, N, yeah, proper secret chunk. If any of, any of this is of missing, then you can yes, reconstruct yes, it yourself. And if the key can be as strong as you like. You want to make yeah. 256 bits key, that's fine. Well, it's so, right, that's but not really the it's, point. It's, it's, not, it's yeah. not the point. No. But, uh, I mean, the difficulty is, as I see it, is how easy is it to get hold of uh, enough because mm -hmm. uh, and I guess <coughs> the the Pico siblings themselves have to have enough oomph to do a mini cryptographic protocol that cannot be replayed mm -hmm. uh, but they also have to have enough uh, tamper resistance that if you find one then you cannot just open it and get its key mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff and uh, I don't presume that the user is going to rewrite new keys into the Pico sibling. So they will come factory program with something that you will then have to pair up to form your key with all the ones that you have. So there's going to be some management. If you want to add another sibling and make it part of the share, probably you have to re-encrypt your Pico, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there was another question from somewhere over here. Hmm? Yes. I have another question regarding the sibling. Would it be possible to use the siblings to track you, for example, in a supermarket? Oh, would it be possible to use the siblings to track me in a supermarket? Okay. So, uh, it would certainly be if the siblings always answer the same thing, mm -hmm. right? But we said we don't want that because otherwise someone could overhear and record that and then unlock my Pico. So, the protocol <coughs> that we need is one a challenge response protocol between the siblings and the Pico where responses are unpredictable. So, on that basis, the things that the siblings say should be different every time. Mm -hmm. And if I am the only person in Norway carrying a Pico, then you can track me in the supermarket. If everybody, instead of passwords, uses Picos, then you'd have continuous chattering of the various uh, Pico siblings around people, but they would not be identifiable because they would still sound different every time. And it's only if you are party to that protocol that you can verify if the sibling is the one that uh, you expect every one of your family or so, someone else's family. So they're sending their identity also encrypted? Yes, well, I must say I haven't written that protocol, out, but it, it has to be a protocol with at least the feature that it cannot be replayed. And I imagine that uh, if we did that, we could do something where we are also hiding the identity. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, yeah, the correct, but, um, what is the security advantage over carrying multiple tokens? I mean, what is uh, if you look at it objectively, and uh, I, for me, it is if I use multiple tokens, I get the same security. Same security as what? Yes, that's just uh, this system. Well, multiple tokens scales up to three or four tokens. We must get to a thousand tokens, right? Okay. And you're not going to carry a suitcase full of tokens. You don't carry a suitcase full of earrings. <laughs> no, but the point is that the, the <coughs> earrings, you just have to have enough earrings to unlock your picker. You don't have to have a new earring for every account. Yeah, they just need enough, uh, <coughs> enough tokens to authenticate. There might be one token uh, in between which is intelligent enough to, uh, like, the people to store um, certificates and stuff, but it's multiple tokens. And, the oh. and this doesn't overcome the security of multiple tokens. Though. I, I mean, I'm not sure we are on the same wavelength. This is multiple tokens. It's just that the tokens have different purposes. All the tokens except one are used to unlock the last one. And the last one is the one that stores the credentials. These other tokens don't store any credentials, don't have any user interface. Yeah, okay. So the difference is that 
the earring token is just there and talks radio and we have to work something out so it doesn't have to have its batteries change every day. Uh, and uh, the only one that I interact with is the one that has this button display whatever else. And I don't want to have earrings with a user interface, <laughs> nose rings with user interface and all that kind of stuff, dentures with user interface. Uh, and they are only there to basically make an electronic clamp around me so that the Pico knows that it's with me. But they are not used for authenticating directly. Yes? This is something different. No. I'll tell you the issue, but health issue. How health is it? If we have all these things around us and we have a big white common gates, we get the radiation. So is it are you planning to check how much it radiates? More or less than cell phone? Yes, now, they are, now they are doing a research that the cell phone are going to cause cancer. So I don't of course. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, um, I mean, uh, the stuff with cell phones is you need enough power to talk to something that is a few kilometers away, which is the radio itself. Right? With this thing, you have to have enough power to talk to something that's one meter away. So there is hope that the transmission power is going to be several orders of magnitude less than what you are already willingly carrying with you mm -hmm. all the time. And if you are worried about the radiation, then I guess once your worries are um, satisfied that your cell phone is safe, whatever is done for the cell phone can be done much better for things that are much shorter range. Like that. Yes? So the RF safety is kind of an overblown thing. Um, in the United States, I've actually got an amateur radio license. I've gone through four theory tests and two Morse code tests, and I've had held the license for quite a while. Um, literally, if you stand in your kitchen by your microwave, you're going to receive a higher dose of any sort of RFI, EMI type interference than you will from carrying your cell phone for an entire year. Um, the actual radiation of things like cell phones or RFID tags is completely overblown. Um, I mean, even if um, for example, if you live near power lines, um, you should worry about that. You shouldn't really worry about the RF from uh, like a cell phone. Um, or for that matter, even just a uh, general, um, yeah, a concrete, concrete will give off um, radio frequency um, to a much higher degree. Um, and the other thing was, that, uh, the gentleman that was talking about tokens, I think, you were referring to, you're thinking of like, say, RSI, RSA Secure ID tokens? Yeah. Well, the problem with that, though, is that with that token, you still need a, the token itself can't be your only means of authentication, because if someone had that token, then they're you. Yeah. You still have to have a username or password or PIN or what have you. Okay, but I have, if I have the Pico and yeah. all the earrings and stuff, then that can authenticate as well. Sure, if someone, you know, kidnaps you and uh, robs your house and finds all your Pico siblings, then that's a different problem. Well, the, the, what is one that would be addressed by having the network server. So if you, someone is kidnapping you and you manage to break your Pico, or to break your, or just drop your earring or whatever it is, uh, and so that the Pico gets locked, they can't unlock it if your network server says, well, that wasn't true, so I'm not going to let this work again. Of course, if you were on trip, you didn't worry so much about stuff, and you said, okay, and next day you can still unlock. They can wait until next morning and unlock. Well, that is all trade-offs. I mean, the paranoid stuff is not something that I say very seriously. But, uh, I mean, the, the, I'm coming to this from trying to make things easier for people who can't stand the passwords as we impose them on them now. Uh, but I also want to explore the boundaries of this. Having said that, this is not going to be major design criteria how to protect things from people who mug you and, and, and abduct you and torture and so on. Because, first of all, because passwords are not good against that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Because actually, I think that might, that is something I think uh, academicals, academic security all focuses on is that if someone kidnaps your daughter, you want to give them your password. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, and, and that, that I mean, it's, uh, I mean, sometimes you don't want too much secure tamper proofing. I mean, it is something that bureaucracy loves. You know, you, oh, you cannot steal from the bank because you worked it worked. Well, but maybe you want 
to make that decision yourself. Mm -hmm. that, that's actually, I, I don't think that should. I mean, it's, it's, it's in well, I think it's, that it's a good is, selling point. This is a very a, good, uh, uh, good observation. And I think that the distinction, I mean, this is just a, an intellectual discussion, not, not so much a practical discussion. But the intellectual distinction here, which I think is relevant, is is there a way of recovering? or is there not? Mm -hmm. If you make a system where at some point, there's a point of no return, I've made it so that I can't retrieve it, nobody else can retrieve it. Well, you want to torture me, torture you want to kill my daughter, well, I'm very sad if you do, <laughs> but even if you do, there's yeah. nothing else I can do. Yes. And at that point, that's it. If there is still the case that, you know, with me here, I can do nothing to help you, mm -hmm. but at home I have a backup, which mm -hmm. if you let me free, I could go and retrieve, then of mm -hmm. course you are still under threat of, you know, I'll do stuff so long, as you then go and go back to your home uh, and redo whatever else needs to be done. So the, 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 I guess the predicate there would be if you let me go back home and it has to be only me because of biometric and so on, uh, by the time I get back home I can have all my support and, and, you know, and, and have machine guns against you. Uh, but uh, uh, intellectually the only difference is between whether anyone can recover or nobody can recover. If nobody can recover then, I mean, Again, there's no rational incentive to torture you or your uh, dear ones, but mm -hmm. they can still do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, if someone, for example, pickpocketed you and took your deco, and then walked right behind you to receive the deco siblings, wouldn't they then be able to identify with various patients? I guess so, yes. So if, if, they, pick, if they, pick, uh, they steal my pico and I don't notice, and I'm still around within range of the people, then they could still use it to authenticate. And they'd have to keep following me with a laptop behind. <laughs> it's not going to be a long range thing. Now, another thing that we have to worry about uh, for this kind of uh, radio authentication is relay attacks. <coughs> so, in, in our group in Cambridge, we've been done quite a bit of work on relay attacks. Relay attacks is where you have a radio token. For example, something that opens a door. And uh, as I go in, I don't have to do an interaction with a specific reader. Just because you know, near here, it radio senses me, and it opens this door. So there's a, a prover is the thing I have in my wallet, and very far is the door. Now, someone sitting next to me in the cafeteria could have something that looks like a door, electronically, <coughs> next to my chair, and then they send with their cell phone or something uh, the signal. They relay the challenge response to some accomplice who is there with something that looks like my token next to the real door. And then the door challenges the fake token, which is sent by uh, cell phone to the guy sitting next to me in the cafeteria. And this challenge is relayed to my pocket. And I don't know that I'm being challenged, but it answered with the correct response. And this is sent back, correct response is sent back there. And then this opens the door for the bad guy who gets in. So relay attack is a problem in this case. And um, the solutions to relay attacks involve typically um, elaborate protocols that do a time bound <coughs> so that, you know, because the speed of light is finite, you cannot be any further away than that if you have taken not more than that. And so with this kind of mechanisms, for which uh, my colleague Marcus Kuhn has uh, developed a specific RFID protocol, then uh, it is possible to uh, limit the relay attack to something that is very close to you, in which case you hope that you might spot it, you might still not. Yes? Uh, did you say anything about uh, back to the bigger siblings? Uh, because you, you did say that uh, your glasses would be uh, fabricated with this thing inside it. Uh, but if you break, say, three of your seven items, then your people would be locked forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, if the items are, are prefabricated and, and can't be written to, how do you then take back it and restore? Yeah, so this is what I said here um, five minutes ago, that there's going to be some mess to do with the, the backing up of the um, PICO and also of the creation addition and key management and backing up of the shares themselves. And I am a bit afraid that this is going to be the weak point of this uh, ecosystem, that this is going to be the thing where the usability 
gets out of control for regular users. Management of these additional shares, making sure you can't get locked out, that you can um, you can decide that this earring is no longer fashionable, so you want to unregister and register a new one. That kind of stuff. So necessarily something that needs uh, specific protocols and specific usability attention. I haven't solved that problem yet. Yes. And I was wondering, you started this uh, the presentation of your paper as a sort of, uh, if we could go away from passwords. <coughs> and uh, this is a very specific design, but the password is more like an API that is very easy to implement. I mean, that, that's, that's the, also why there are so many implementations and why Sony didn't encrypt their passwords, because that's not part of the API, it's just something we should do. So uh, I was wondering if, if you're thinking of, of just taking some of the core ideas, such as the visual, visual side channel and radio, as in this case, but essentially a network or high bandwidth channel that is indirect, as a sort of a framework or concept, because I mean, the Pico is probably going to be made in China with a back door and sold cheaply here. Anyway, <laughs> so, so I mean, I mean, um, because the system, parts of the system could definitely be used today with a smartphone and so I'm, where are yeah, you going well, with that? Are you going with this as, as a sort of exercise in designing the Pico or would you actually try to do a work to, to actually try and replace passwords as a system? Well, uh, you can do both. <laughs> I am trying to replace passwords, and especially the part of the password problem that are the most aggravating. And for that reason, I have set as my zero principle that I want not to rely on users remembering things. Mm -hmm. And I said, what can I do for that? And I started building something. But I said, at least for intellectual honesty, I have to provide a system that is complete. So whenever I do something, I cannot say, well, and then you know, someone else works out the details for that. So let's at least start from a design where all the bases are covered. Mm -hmm. But still, this is a fairly modular thing. I could have easily stopped at the point of saying, here's the Pico. And then so long as you don't lose the Pico, it's, it's OK, which is what, I mean, you could say RSA, uh, RS What's the secure ID token does that? You know, you have the secure ID. It lets you uh, authenticate to the thing, but you know, so long as you don't lose, it, or maybe it's protected by a pin or whatever, and it's already addressed by yeah, I'll come back to you in a moment. Uh, so you could cut this uh, Pico work in at least two parts. One that says this is how the Pico works. This is how it changes. How it does SSL like things, and it doesn't do passwords anymore. And this is how you secure the Pico. You want it to secure something else, be my guest. You want to use a pin on that, it, I mean, I just look disgusted <laughs> to me, but do that. Yeah. <laughs> so that is a, a kind of already two separate discussions. You know, how to make um, the thing uh, in a way that all these things, I mean, we could, we could certainly split, mm -hmm. uh, split out several parts of what I did. The, the, the multi-channel protocols work that we did several years before mm -hmm. did, wasn't related to that either. Uh, this is one way of saying, is there, if we had no constraints of compatibility, is there a complete solution that we could roll out which we would consider better? And I would consider this better except for the management problem of the, of the shares uh, so far. Yeah, I just want to say that it's 13 minutes until lunch. Okay. Of course, we can use a few additional extra minutes, but uh, I'll make sure that uh, Frank Stoyano joins in for dinner, and uh, those of you who would like to <laughs> talk more to him, join him for dinner. It's that easy. <laughs> right. So I, uh, I'm very grateful for the interaction that uh, you are offering, and this thing here says 24 out of 37. Now I've already seen the slides, so I don't actually care. I mean, I'm much happier <laughs> talking with you than seeing the other slides. If you want me to go through the other slides, I can do that. But uh, if yeah, you I prefer to keep asking questions, then no, I'm I think, happy I think we should questions. let you finish the presentation. I mean, some of the questions on backups, I think you were in the middle of talking about them. All right. Kind of so yeah. no more questions. Let him <laughs> finish the presentation. Period. <laughs> So continuous authentication is a feature that I like about Pico, which is uh, not often uh, spoken about drawback of password authentication, where you're just authenticated at one point, and then you have a window of vulnerability, which is bigger the, the less you hassle the user. So um, 
it would be great if the authentication worked with telepathy that as soon as you are uh, not there, then you are not, uh, the, the, it looks like you logged down. And as soon as you're back there, it looks like you log in again. So with Pico, you can do that because you interact with radio, then you have a, um, a way of doing the check all the time without bothering the user uh, with interaction. So the interaction is required at the beginning, like authentication session start, so that you can't have things like um, unlocking your account without your consent. But then once you are in there, so long as you're, stay, you're staying in there, you can keep on re-authenticating uh, with sub-minute uh, resolution if you want. So uh, for practical implementation of this, and uh, the, I must say that was a very nice paper that you should read if you're interested in this side of thing, continuous authentication, in uh, uh, Mobicom 2002 called Zero Interaction Authentication by Corner and Noble. And they had something where a token was used to encrypt, uh, well, to unlock a full disk encryption laptop. And as soon as you went away, then it would clear the cache and it would be locked. And as soon as you went back, it would re, um, uh, re decrypt the thing. And so uh, things that would be interesting in the case of Pico, where you are using it, for example, for your login password and then your uh, uh, Gmail account kind of things, where there's a nested <coughs> session inside that, would be how do you deal with those nested sessions? You need to also preserve state so that when you uh, go away and come back, it's more a suspend resume than a log out log in, because you wouldn't want to go away and go back and see that all your app applications have disappeared because you have been logged out. So some of them are going to be inside other of them, and uh, the nesting order might matter. And again, we have to be aware of relay attacks. If this is something where I don't give the consent at the first, after the first time, it could be that I could just be relayed somewhere else. Delegation and escrow is something that can be dealt with, uh, with something that I mentioned earlier in the uh, coercion slide, uh, where you can decide to have more than one Pico holding different credentials, different grades of credentials. You can have uh, things that are used for one purpose uh, and things for a higher security purpose you don't bring when you go on a, a dangerous trip. But you could also do a partition along another dimension. You can say, I have my own private things on a Pico and my corporate things on another Pico, and this corporate Pico may be escrowed, so there may be other I mean, the company system administrator can have a special Pico siblings that unlock that one, but they still won't have access to my own personal things. So I could partition, air gap, physically partition my credentials in this way by having several Picos. Uh, the fact of being able to register more Pico siblings and giving them to someone for escrow is something that may be useful even in the personal case for something like you know, your digital testament. You don't want all your uh, things to access your, uh, for example, bank accounts and so on. Uh, to not be available to anybody if you just die, and so in that case, you know, your biometric goes away, uh, you might give your spouse uh, enough Pico siblings to unlock your uh, Pico in case of necessity, even though with, you know, with the agreement that it's only used in, uh, in case of death. Uh, and so this seems like a very versatile solution, and the only problem I see again is the practical one of this proliferation of tokens. If I start having several people, one for this purpose, one for private credentials, one for public credentials, one for uh, work, and so on, then uh, I will not have the correct Pico with me the time I need it. So that uh, <coughs> flexible, but maybe uh, can become too flexible. Another interesting thing that I uh, <coughs> think is perhaps the most one of the most intellectually stimulating aspects of this in the context of not just getting rid of web passwords, but all passwords. Uh, I have, in the paper I've been working, I, I mean, I, I spent a few pages on what are the other apps that are not web apps. There could be things like you log in to your uh, computer, either locally or, or uh, our network system, or you go into your BIOS, or you go into um, uh, the, the thing that locks your car stereo so it can't be stolen, or the thing for your burglar alarm, all things that are not web applications. So there are ways of dealing with that. But the most interesting one is one where there are passwords that are not used for authentication. 
So none of these, none of the above. And that's, uh, when I look at file encryption, for example, it's fundamentally different from uh, login with username and password. Because with, with username and password, it's, the app is a kind of gatekeeper that says, prove to me that you're authorized. If you're authorized, I open the gate and I let you in. With the encryption, it's not that. It's not that if you're authorized, I let you in. It's that I need those bits in order to do the decryption. So the password is something that is used for generating the key that actually decrypts the file. And without the password, there's no gatekeeper that can say, well, you're authorized, you're not authorized. I just need those bits. So I have tried fitting that into the mold of the username, password kind of thing. See, if I could model this, when you have the pairing and the main button with this, but who would be the app, maybe the encryption program? Who would be the user ID? I don't know, the file name? It didn't quite sound right, right? Uh, if I, I could encrypt the same file under different passwords if I want. Uh, so all of this is, uh, I think, a, um, a different way of using passwords that should be treated appropriately. And it's not right to use the same SSL-like public key and so on mechanism for generating a key. So this is, I think, should be dealt with differently. And in this case, the Pico should have some randomly generated bit string that it sends off in the same way that it would send a password if it were a password wallet. So the interaction has to be different in this case. However, if I do this, then there's a problem with my promises of what the Pico will do. I said, uh, the Pico will, uh, will not ask you to choose the right credentials for this, and it will not uh, let you uh, be fished. In this case, because there is nothing, there is no public key I can speak to, uh, it will be possible for some malicious application to present me with a file and say, now give me the keys to decrypt that file. And I have to select the right key, and I can recognize the key for the crypt net file, but I have no assurance that I'm talking to the right application that I meant, uh, and so that string could be stolen from me. Now, I've, I've thought hard about this. If anybody wants to keep discussing this, I'd be delighted to have a chat about this. But I believe, I, have not, I don't have a proof, but I believe that there's nothing uh, theoretically that could be done to stop uh, <coughs> someone stealing the, the key in this case. How can I avoid uh, how can I recognize that this, I'm, I'm not the victim of some man in the middle that is asking me for the password? So this is a uh, difficult to read slide, but perhaps the most important. Uh, and I have listed here various ways of uh, replacing passwords or doing better than passwords. And I have listed here the minimum principle, the zero point something. Here are the ones that Pico promises to do, and here are the things that uh, Pico doesn't actually worry about. So as cheap as, as cheap to deploy passwords and no changes to the servers. Now this part is out of date in the paper. I'm still uh, adding more related work. And in this last column, what I say is has been built, because it's unfair to compare features with something that, you know, I do all these things. I don't actually exist. <laughs> So uh, these things have been built. Uh, these things are you know, just academic papers. Uh, these things that have been built are publicly available, because some of these are academic papers, have been built, but nobody's using them, or have been built, are not even published. And uh, some of these widely deployed, so have been built, and actually uh, people use that a lot. So um, there's no time to go through every uh, square of this. Um, of this slide, but it's interesting to uh, do a comparison with the previous stuff. And, and in fact, the one that is most interesting here, especially for filling those parts here, is the single sign-on. So single sign-on is a completely different approach to getting rid of passwords, but it offers uh, many of these benefits. Uh, and I guess a notable, uh, notable exception here is that uh, does it replace all passwords, or just the web ones, or just the online ones, and this is something that single sign-on cannot do. So, compromises 
to reach critical <coughs> mass. Well, um, this is my academic ancestor, Roger Needham, was the PhD supervisor of my PhD supervisor. And uh, he said, optimization is the process of taking something that works and replacing it with something that almost works, but costs less. So in that spirit, we might consider optimizing the design of the Pico, uh, turning it into something that costs less and uh, almost works. Uh, and one of these things could be to implement it on a smartphone. And the almost works refers to the fact that the operating system of the smartphone may leak the credentials in a number of ways. Uh, another thing would be, OK, if we just want to be compatible with what exists today, so that there's a chance that this will be adopted. Instead of doing all this public key business, just have the Pico store your passwords and spit out the passwords into the application. So at least the backends don't have to be changed. Because if you have to change the backends, who's ever going to change the backends? Um, and um, as we said earlier, we could replace all these Pico siblings business with just a master password or a PIN that you type to unlock your um, your Pico, which uh, of course defeats the uh, first uh, requirement that I started with, but uh, some may think, well, it just saves me so much headache that it may be uh, a good place to start. So, this last section here is the grand plan for world liberation from passwords. And, uh, I mean, the, the, there's not much serious stuff here. It's mostly <laughs> Uh, a plan, but you know, first you have to build one that can withstand an adversarial review. Then, uh, once you have something that you can try out, you have to give it to users and see if they can actually make it work. Is it any better than passwords? Otherwise, there's no point going any further. Uh, and then, at that point, is the time to redesign it and re engineer it. And then, uh, for building it into critical mass, you have to give in on some things. Uh, you, you have to uh, convince Facebook. <laughs> yeah, so you have to make things that, um, even though they are optimizations in the Roger Needham sense, let you have a foothold. And then after that, you can build on this. And um, when, once you get to the point where the login pages look like uh, this one here, where there is uh, the user ID and password, and <coughs> next to it, the facilities to use people, then uh, you are you're happy because everyone who has a Pico can still get all the benefits of it and everyone who doesn't have can still use the thing as before and gradually you see the populations uh, change in percentage hopefully but that's a stage where you're not fighting for uh, acceptance anymore because every provider every app will be happy to just support both if enough people have it and eventually you get to no more passwords so uh, my conclusions are that passwords are now beyond their sell-by date. So many of us have said that uh, in the past few years, and uh, so many of us have tried to provide uh, some replacements. Now, you may consider this a very complicated way of replacing passwords. I might agree with you. Uh, but uh, even though it's going to be difficult to tackle the backwards compatibility problem. We have a duty to think of something better than passwords for our users. And I believe that the things I said in opening, all these complaints about hating passwords are well justified when you see how unreasonable the aggregate constraints we put on users are. So I think this is the first proposal to eliminate passwords everywhere, not just from web or online sites. And uh, this is the end of this. And the paper is in draft uh, somewhere on the uh, Light Blue Touch Paper blog. I'm still working on this draft. I was uh, writing new stuff even on the plane to here. I will certainly be writing more stuff after all we said today and after uh, future interactions. Uh, we have maybe a dinner. And uh, if you're interested in doing any more with this, uh, talk to me. Uh, I have explicitly decided not to patent any aspect of this. Uh, this is all going to be royalty free. You want to build it and become rich, be my guest. Just sign the paper. Thank you very much.